Welcome to Teaching Artist Podcast, a show dedicated to discussions of teaching art to kids, making art, and how those things overlap and feed each other. I'm Rebecca Potts, your host, a visual arts teaching artist. Thank you so much for listening. This one is a bit of a longer episode with another incredible collage artist, Andy Harris. So I'm not going to talk too much. I'm just going to get right into it. Andy Harris talked about teaching with a focus on bringing out the superpowers within his students. He shared some amazing projects that use art to consider identity and build relationships within the classroom. He also shared some great advice for artists around seeking opportunities and being ready when doors open. I loved hearing about his process, from collecting images to painting, cutting, and gluing paper, drawing on his experience hanging wallpaper. Andy Harris graduated from VCU, currently works out of his studio in Norfolk, Virginia, and teaches art in Virginia Beach City Public Schools. His practice involves the patient observation of environments to gather the collected stories they tell. He finds revelations in trash, poached bicycles, ice cream melting on the sidewalk, or from the way the afternoon sun cuts across a motel sign. When taken out of their natural context, these inadvertently overlooked moments become the opportunities he seizes for developing work. He utilizes exploratory methods to paint paper, which is ultimately manipulated to create multi-layered collages inspired by observations of environments. Let's hear from Andy. So I am talking with Andy Harris today, and I'm excited to hear more about your practice. I've seen some of your work, but I don't know a lot about your background. So could we start there? Could you walk us through your background, how you got into art and also teaching? Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks for having me. Um, I'm yeah. super excited and, and I'm always happy when someone wants to hear about my life. <laughs> I'm, yes. I'm like, oh, yes. Yeah, let me talk. <laughs> um, so I went to VCU, Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, mm-hmm. and, and I was going to an art school and I thought I wanted to be an animator. But mm-hmm. at the same time, I was playing in like a heavy metal thrash band from Richmond that, that got pretty big rather quickly. And so the art thing kind of was like on the side once that started going. <laughs> and I mean, I, I, I tell this story all the time. It was like I was doing these animated projections on sculptures and they were very like kid friendly. And one of my professors was like, hey, listen, I got you an interview at the local PBS station working on their programming. And I was like, so I w- first of all, I was like, no freaking way this is happening. And I was like, so scared of failing. And I was doing this music mm. thing that I just didn't show up. <laughs> and so that was like one of my big regrets. I was just so scared. I was like, you know what? I, I was like, they'll never hire me. So I just didn't show mm-hmm. up. And so mm-hmm. I, I think about that. And I, I tell my students that a lot too. I was like, that was a mistake. When life mm-hmm. opens a door for you, you jump through it. You go through it. You take it because you yeah. will regret it. And you there's just no telling where it's going to lead to. But you know mm-hmm. what? I'm really stoked with the way things have turned out. And so after art school, like I said, we toured with a band uh, called Municipal Waste for a few years and then decided that the touring life and the music like wasn't for me there was just some differences it wasn't for me so I, I moved back to Virginia Beach Virginia and that's mm-hmm. where I actually started hanging wallpaper just to make money and then before mm-hmm. I blinked my eyes three years had passed and I was like oh my gosh I'm a wallpaper hanger <laughs> which <laughs> I mean if you've ever hung wallpaper it's the most stressful thing ever and so, yeah, that was my day-to-day life. <laughs> I was constantly like trying to get good at something that I was never going to be really good at. But while I'm hanging wallpaper in hotels and things like that, I'm drawing all over the walls. I'm cutting up the materials that were used. I'm doing all this weird art stuff and getting in trouble and getting asked to leave the, the job site for the day for having my music too loud and stuff like that. <laughs> so there was this real joy and pleasure that was happening inside of me when I was making these things um, while at work. And and I knew it was something I needed to pursue. Mm -hmm. And so I had friends who were teaching 
And they were having these adventurous summers. And one of my friends was a photographer and a screen printer. And, and he was like starting these side. He was just doing all these things that I was really attracted to. So mm -hmm. I, was, I was like, you know what? I'm going to I'm gonna try to teach. And the only thing that, I, you know, with my degree, I'm going to teach art. Now I was doing art on the side, but it was just like a lot of journaling, a lot of drawing, a lot of stuff with mm -hmm. no direction. Just my body having to like make these things, but not really understanding why I'm making them, just kind of doing mm -hmm. it. And also never really taking it seriously, like kind of half-assing it. And so I said, I'm going to be an art teacher. And I, I got interviewed a couple of times and didn't get the jobs. And, and I kind of got, you know, down and out. And then this one school called me. It was a, it was a private school. And they said, hey, would you like to uh, come interview for the job? And, and I was so over it at that point. I answered. It was a Thursday. And I said, yeah, I, I can interview on Monday. <laughs> like it's so arrogant but at the same time my spirits had been crushed and I didn't want to get my hopes up again so mm -hmm. I said yeah and they were like okay well then Monday it is and then I went there Monday saw the building was like wow this is really cool and then on my way back home from the interview they called and asked if I would turn around and come sign the contract so wow. yeah that's how I got into teaching now listen I'd never I had worked at the local contemporary art museum, the MOCA here in, in Virginia Beach, mm -hmm. in Virginia. And so I had done some dosing. So I'd worked with kids standing in front of a piece of art. And, and there was these powerful moments where I was like, wow, this is really cool. Getting them to mm -hmm. just make up stories about the art and, and getting them to notice parts that they may have been passing up. But so I knew that I liked working with kids in, in the field of art. But now I was going to have to teach it and run a classroom. And to be honest with you, it was really scary and it was super stressful because I'm always the one that feels like I'm not doing it as good as I should be doing. Mm -hmm. And But looking back on it, I'm, I'm in my 11th year teaching now. Mm -hmm. Looking back on it, I learned to teach by being thrown out there and trying and, and, and adapting and figuring out, hey, what works, what doesn't. Mm -hmm. And then I started getting the classes to get my professional license because I was working on a provisional for my first two years. Mm -hmm. And as I'm taking these, these education classes, I'm like, this stuff, I was like, I'm already doing all this. This is just a different, you guys are calling it something else. I'm pretty much having to learn your language, but I'm already, do, I'm already differentiating instruction for the kid who can't even hold a pencil. Mm -hmm. I was just having to learn a different language. And, and, I, and I also, I was thinking to myself, if I hadn't gone my chosen path, I probably wouldn't have been a teacher. But because I, this doesn't interest me. What interests me is getting in there with a child and, and challenging them with design and emotion and things like that and, and seeing what they make and being a part of their process. That's what really drew me to teaching. And so my, uh, my first school that I taught at was a, a private school for uh, students with learning differences. So I would have a classroom of maybe 10 students which is mm -hmm. really low. But at the same time, you know, like I said, one student had a hard time holding a pencil, one had dyslexia, one had dysgraphia. There was, they all had these special powers. And so mm -hmm. I had to like, I learned right then and there that I'm not going to say, hey, today we're drawing bicycles. Hey, today we're painting landscapes. What I learned is I'm throwing out a couple of walls for you to bounce on and you can choose whatever materials you want. You just have mm -hmm. to make this happen. And and then we would, I would do skill stuff as well, but I found that to be the most effective thing. Yeah. And and so that kind of brings me to, as far as teaching today, is about four years ago, a, a job opened for the gifted program that they have for Virginia Beach City Public Schools. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, I'm really comfortable. I don't think I'll ever leave unless something like that job pops up. And it popped up one day and I just jumped. I went for it. And I, mm -hmm. I, I killed the interview. I just felt like it was meant to be. It was like one of those mm -hmm. things where it just feels right. And so I've been at that school, Old Donation School in Virginia Beach now uh, for, this is my fourth fourth year. And so I teach students identified as gifted. So they don't go to their home school. They actually bus to this specific location. Mm -hmm. And it is awesome. It is so cool. I mean, they like, they're so intelligent and so bright and so creative that on my bad days, they lift me up. And so it's a great place to work. That's um, amazing. Yeah. And so, you know, as far as like teaching art, that's where I'm at right now. Yeah, no, I feel like that's a really interesting story. And there's so much in there. A couple of things that stood out to me were within your own art making this sort of, and we'll get, I guess we'll get more into your art making a little bit later, but I loved this idea of just your body, like having to make these things and not quite understanding why or where they're coming from and not really harnessing them. 
But I feel like that impulse also maybe influences teaching. I don't know if you'd want to talk about that. Like, how does that come into your teaching? And do you see that sort of impulse in students? And how do you encourage that? Yeah, I think if you're like teacher of the year who has their curriculum and and every lesson plan for every day mapped out, if they come into my room, they'd have a heart attack. They'd be like, <laughs> "Oh my god, you know." But I just don't operate that way. And mm. and when the time comes, if if someone needs some documentation, I make it, I have it. I just need to formulate it. It's there. But really exactly what you just said, when I come into the the studio, and I know that we're going to be creating on these specific topics. Mm. I don't really like to teach the same project year after year because I teach sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. Mm-hmm. And if there's a kid walking by my classroom and they see us all building huge soda cans, like when it's their turn to come to me, I don't want them to be like, oh, yeah, like you were te-. like, I want them to have something new and fresh. So I'm always mm-hmm. kind of reinventing the wheel and trying to stay fresh. And I think that's kind of hits on what you were saying. There's some part of me that the art artist in me is always pushing. So if you look at my work, I go down these little pathways and I I take Mm -hmm. them for like five, 10, 15 pieces of art. And then I start to steer somewhere else. And I think it's just Mm -hmm. growing, right? It's just how growing looks on me. Like where's the next challenge going to be? How can I get better at that? And then once I kind of get to a place where I feel like I understand something, I like to go another direction. So as far as teaching art, whenever my art might start to like get stale, Mm -hmm. being able to go in the classroom and work with kids, it always ignites something in my own practice. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, being an artist as well, that's kind of how I've always felt like was going to be my strong point. Like I didn't go to school to be a teacher, but I've always been an artist. So I've kind of felt like, you know, it's time to put that part of you in overdrive, like apply for everything make Mm -hmm. every second you can, you know, let's do this thing. And so maybe part of that is trying to prove to myself that, you know, worthy to be in the position that I am, which I think a lot of us feel like, I, you know, I've heard a lot of teachers kind of say similar things. But yeah, I think going in the classroom and working with students is part of my art making process, which is kind of Mm -hmm. cool. I never really thought about it. until I just said that out loud. (laughs) That's amazing. I love it. (laughs) Having Mm -hmm. like revelations. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Uh, And sometimes just talking about it, you know, helps you formulate what's really going on. What am I really thinking about? Yeah. I also loved how you talked about the students sort of having special powers, like having these superpowers almost. Yeah. I called my old school like Professor X and his X-Men. I was like, Uh, like, dude, they all, okay, here's an example. So I I taught this one girl who obviously had some vision problems, but it wasn't documented. Like it wasn't mm -hmm. in her file or anything, but I would literally draw a circle and we would play like copy me. And so I would Mm -hmm. watch, I would say, hey, follow what I'm doing on a piece of paper, like right next to her. And and I'd draw a circle and then I'd see her circle and it would be more of like a square. And Mm -hmm. I was like, there's a disconnect in the processing here. So what we did was we took that weird shaky hand that she had that most people see as bad handwriting Mm -hmm. or, you know, someone who doesn't know this child thinks sloppy, thinks lazy, sloppy or something like that. Right. So I see it and I'm like, all right, we're going to do these mini paintings and then we're going to throw it into a projector and then we're going to make, we're going to, we're going to project it up onto this wall and you're going to trace your own paintings on four by four boards. So then Mm. all of a sudden she has these like huge, beautiful painting Uh, that she made just, mm -hmm. just, we had to figure out a way for her to make these beautiful things out of what she was capable of. Yeah. So that was her special power. Right. And it's like helping her sort of translate what she's doing to a media that fits for what she's doing. Exactly. And, yeah. and I knew if she wasn't going to be stoked on it, I would have just let it fall by the wayside. But when mm-hmm. she steps back and she's like, oh, my God, I made that. I was like, all right, cool. Yeah, that's, yes. I was like, my job's done here. Get uh, out of here. <laughs> yeah, uh, I love that. And I love that helping students see themselves as artists, right? Like, mm-hmm. that's what that moment is when she steps back and she's like, wow, I did that. She's seeing that she has this ability. She's an artist. Yeah, it's it, yeah. I think when that stuff happens, it's like you really, as a teacher, you kind of see the impact that you can have. Mm-hmm. So it's a good reminder that what we're doing is worthy. 
Yeah. It's, it's also a good reminder that when it's Friday and two o'clock and I am completely over it, that I have to (laughs) remain somewhat human and kind and caring when really I just want to bolt for the door because I'm tired. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? So I have to, you know, it works both ways. I have to remember that they're always watching. Yeah. Yeah. And that everything you do really does have an impact. Yeah, because like the people I admire usually are the ones that I've seen in stressful situations and handle it really well. And I'm like, damn, Mm. I want that. So I need to model that. That's that stuff's important because it's really easy to to have your life stuff come in the classroom with you. I mean, Mm -hmm. you know, like it's really easy to get distracted with something going on in your life. And you kind of have to put that actor's mask on. Mm hmm. Yeah, thinking about the impact that we make and just something that I've been thinking a lot about and trying to sort of navigate is the impact we have as teachers, the power that we have as educators, just how we're sort of wielding that power and how we're spreading that power, thinking about creating like the buzzwords, creating an anti-racist classroom and Mm -hmm. decolonizing your curricula. I feel like, you know, these words, there's a lot of of issues around the words that we're using. But Mm -hmm. the idea there, I feel like really boils down to using your power for good and also spreading that power so it's not all in your hands. And I guess I'd just love to hear your thoughts there and and what you're doing as a teacher around those issues. I feel like I try to bring as much as my per, like my own personal interest into the classroom because I really want mm-hmm. the, my students to know me. And so that being said, like like most of the artists and the musicians and the actors that I like don't look like me. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm always <laughs> sharing different things that I like. And it's mm-hmm. cool with kids because it's cool with the age that I teach because pretty much anything that I've liked since I was like 25 or before, they've never even you know heard of before <laughs> just because of the age gap. Yeah. So I'm always showing them musicians and things like that and artists that I really dig. And But also, I think it's really important that they do the same thing. So Mm -hmm. I don't want my classroom to be like, come in, I'm directing the show. I I feel like I want to be their art colleague, not their, um, Mm. I don't know how to, I don't know what I'm trying to say. I almost want to say like, in some ways, we're all on the same level, right? We're all creatives Mm -hmm. trying to get this thing out. So that being said, I want to know what you're into and and what it's like when you go home and sit down with dinner. What's at your table? And Mm -hmm. and what do you guys talk about? So ways that I've been doing that through art projects and things like that. One opener thing that I do a lot of times is we make zines, these like simple hand folded Mm -hmm. little booklets. But the zines have to be some type of family recipe. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it's my little trick because what I'm really looking at is like, what are the cultural differences between your family and my family and his Mm -hmm. family and her family? What are the differences? To them, they're making a cool little book that they get to make some food that they're familiar with. But really Mm -hmm. what they're doing is they're sharing everyone's differences. And Mm -hmm. so I feel like I try to do that as many times as possible in different ways, just so that, I don't know, I, I mean... Well, really, like at a basic level, everyone's so interesting. I just want to know the interesting, cool things about you. And I want to know your differences and I want to experience those things. And and mm-hmm. also, I want to give my students an experience that I did not have when I was in high school. I didn't have, my art teachers weren't doing stuff like this, right? Mm-hmm. They weren't worried about what was going on with me once I left school and, you know, what other people thought about it. They weren't thinking about that stuff, but those things had a big impact on me. So I, I try to remember that. At the beginning of this kind of little project we're working on now, I had them write like every word they could possibly describe to describe themselves physically, right? And I was Mm -hmm. like, get weird. I was like, knock out all the big stuff, like, you know, hair color, eye color, skin color. And then I was like, then get weird. Like, is your middle toe bigger than the rest of all of them? Like, I was like, do you have weird long fingers? Or do you have short little, like, get weird, write down things about your physical body. Mm -hmm. And then I had them um, write a list on, and they they didn't have to share this part. Actually, they weren't sharing this part. But Mm -hmm. uh, list down things about your personality, both pros and cons, things you like, and things you don't like about your personality. So what I was Mm -hmm. really essentially, you can tell, is getting them to write their identity down in in descriptive words on a paper. Mm -hmm. So from those words, I was like, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to use a little bit of symbolism. We're going to try 
to somehow create this next sculpture that encompasses some of these words combined together. But Mm -hmm. in your artist statement at the end of the project, you don't have to tell me why you chose what you chose. The mystery's there. You're going to put it out there and we're going to accept it for whatever it is. We're going to make the call. So Mm -hmm. what we did is, and we're still doing it right now, they're all building these gigantic house plants. (laughs) And the house plants don't have to be a plant that could survive inside. It could be like some Amazon jungle plant that eats baby rabbits or something like that. Like (laughs) it could be something really weird. But then also equally important is what's holding the roots. What is the Mm -hmm. vessel that's holding the roots of this thing? It doesn't have to necessarily be a pot, but it can be if you want to. But what I ask you to do is I want you to, in your mind, somehow connect some of your words to the things that you're choosing. I forget where how I came up with this. I have no idea, but it's turned into this really beautiful thing. And not only that, mm. like words gotten around school. So I have all these visitors coming to take a look at them and, and, uh, mm. and check them out. And I mean, there's just the coolest stuff. There's this one really tall, skinny girl whose plant, whose vase is like four feet high and about as round as a coffee can. (laughs) And then the Mm. leaves are on these really tall stems. And I just love it because it's it's her. It's like her in plant form. It's Uh. so cool. So I think that kind of touches on your question a little bit a ton of other stuff but that's kind of what's like that's kind of how I'm relating to what we're doing right now what's like right in front of me yeah well I feel like there's so much in there and little tips that I pull out of that are with the zine project exactly what you were saying about using this sort of topic like it's a fairly broad topic share a family recipe so it's something everybody has an entry point for in some way and then it's a way to share their culture Sure. And, you know, where they're coming from, what's important to them in their family. And food is huge. Like, that's such a great connector. We all eat. We all, you know, <laughs> yeah. like food's such a like cultural connector, too. Oh, and absolutely. Then that also, I felt like that one, I don't know if you know about the teaching tolerance which I guess just renamed themselves Learning for Justice, but they have a set of social justice standards. And Mm -hmm. that project sounds like it would hit a bunch of those standards. There are things like, I'm looking at it now, students will express comfort with people who are both similar to and different from them and engage respectfully with all people. Um, develop positive social identities based on their membership in multiple groups in society. Yeah, just, I guess, basically thinking about their differences with their classmates and with their teacher and the similarities between themselves and their classmates and their teacher. There's just a lot of power there. Yeah. Um, And and, and I think if you make, like, I totally support, like, if you give them the option to direct their own art Mm -hmm. and not just saying like you can choose what you know you can draw these eyes however you want like that's not (laughs) enough so if you want to somehow incorporate different fabrics or something into your project you need to be allowed to do you need to do that Mm -hmm. and you can kind of be that like if you have a room full of kids it's much harder to do but that's where you're like hey I think you should do this but I also think you should step up and if you need something you need to get it and you need to bring it like I'm not Mm -hmm. gonna like I'm not gonna get every single thing you need you need to make this happen, which Mm -hmm. I personally, I think it's good. I think it's what they need. I mean, they're doing it. It's their artwork. You know, Mm -hmm. the days of like 30 kids making like clone artworks of their art Mm -hmm. that their art teacher makes is, you know, that's, oh, it's done. Let's do something real. But I'm looking at this website now. It's great. Yeah. There's (laughs) so much, so much there. And the other thing, talking about the plant project that I also, I love how you're pushing them, encouraging them to talk about identity or at least think about identity. But I think one thing that stood out to me that's really important there is letting them choose how much they want to share. Because you oh, know yeah. it can be a hard topic to dig into. And, you know, some kids might be all about like, I want to share every little bit. I want to share everything I'm uncovering <laughs> and thinking about yeah. like this is me. And, and then the kid kids next to them is saying like like, why am I not like that? Mm. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? The kid next to them is going, why do I, why, why would I rather die than tell anybody <laughs> who I really am? Yeah. What, you know, what's wrong with me? You know what I'm saying? Uh, like, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, but that's all real stuff, right? It's like, mm-hmm. it's, 
it's real. Yeah, there's like a social emotional connection to that too. So the, right. the title of the project is Caring for Houseplants because I was, mm. you know, just kind of thinking of a way in order they could talk about to kind of get at it. It's like, man, you know, care for yourself, mm -hmm. you know, learn about yourself, love yourself, those types of things as well. Yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. And that reminds me, I, I've done this much smaller scale and simple project where we looked at this artist or really artist duo called Chowza. I don't know if you mm -hmm. know them. Adam Frezza and Terry Chow. They make these really sort of playful, fantastical plant sculptures. They do a lot of just like beautiful sort of minimal work, but I, I love their work. But kids really responded to seeing their work as well. Yeah, yeah. there's something about when a student see something that is like because I, I love that like kind of rudimentary someone called my artwork naive and and at first mm -hmm. i took offense i was like naive mm -hmm. and then i went and looked it up and i was like oh wait it's like a term that curators use to talk, to say like it kind of us it it pulls away from traditional skills and things like that and mm -hmm. i was like actually that's pretty cool i was like yeah my work's naive. so <laughs> i think students respond to that naive work right they mm -hmm. see something and they're like whoa i could do that like, yeah. I feel like if I tried, I could do that. And so I I've noticed the same thing. Like, kids really respond to some r rambunctious art. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I would love to also hear about your, like, your teaching situation now and also how you have managed through the pandemic. What has shifted? What things, especially as we sort of are coming out of it, crossing fingers, mm -hmm. knocking on wood? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what are the positive things that you want to keep that have shifted your teaching practice? Well, you know... There was something cool. Okay, so when when we went here in Virginia, we went all virtual. I think we probably most mm -hmm. most of the country did. And yeah. so I started teaching for my studio mm -hmm. and I loved it, right? Um, <laughs> well, first of all, I got this big project. Like the day that schools got shut down, I got an email and it was like, hey, do you want to do this project? And it was huge. And I was like, uh. yes, 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 yes. So <laughs> I, I, I'll get into that here in a few. But yeah. as far as the teaching goes, I kind of liked teaching from my studio because I was working the whole time. They were seeing that I was in mm -hmm. my own creative space and flowing. And it, it kind of stunk that we did these like side chats so that we could little artist talks on the side where I could see their work and we could have a one-on-one mm -hmm. -on -one talk without everyone else there. The verbalization was still there, but I wasn't actually there to hold and touch it and look at it. So, you know, they were missing out on a lot of that. Mm -hmm. But as far as materials and things go, I was like, we made it happen. And it was mm -hmm. cool. It almost makes them, it's like, dude, you're not always going to have Mr. Harris's class to come to and use all my stuff. You're going to have to figure out how to make your work happen. So we're doing it now, you know, <laughs> that's what mm -hmm. we're doing. I was like, dig through your recycling bin. And I, I'm sure a lot of our teachers got just as resourceful as me. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it had some cool stuff to it. Now, what's happening now is we have this hybrid where we have some kids at home and some in school. And that's counterproductive because mm -hmm. it's it's impossible to give the 100 percent to the people at home because I have mm -hmm. students in front of me who I'm responsible for their physical well-being and I have them using tools and things like that. So I can't be on a computer with other artists at the same time. So I'm not digging that part, but mm. there was something cool about us, you know, in the studios and everyone at home. And, and, and it was like, in my head, I was like, oh man, they're just, they're not going to be making cool stuff. I'm so bummed. And then they would, a uh, critique day would come and we would like, they'd upload their projects and stuff. And I'd be like, oh my God, I'd be like, you don't <laughs> even need me as an art teacher. I'm like, yeah, look at that. That's incredible. Like they were making uh. really good work. So so the products were there. The conversations mm. were still there. We just weren't, you know, I wasn't physically there to be like, paint this more, paint this more, you know, right. this part needs to be rebuilt or something like that. I, I will say too, I went more sculptural route when we went virtual. Whereas when I'm with my kids, I teach them how to uh, up their drawing game a lot because mm -hmm. I like to draw a lot. So I can't share that part I, that, you know, virtual teaching took that superpower from me. <laughs> so I kind of, mm. I, ha I had to adapt. Yeah. Yeah. But I definitely, I feel like a lot of people are going to relate to resonate with this, you know, the loss of materials, the loss of the classroom space, but then what that created, what that brought. Yeah. I mean, we had to practice what we preach, right? Like mm -hmm. we practice, we preach. If you're anything like me, you constantly preach problem solving, coming up with solutions, facing challenges. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so we had to actually do that. And 
I think that made a lot of people uncomfortable, but it made that's where I thrive. I don't necessarily thrive in the writing of the, the curriculum unit, <laughs> but I do thrive in the face of like, let's make something cool with two different materials that we found in the garbage today. <laughs> you know? Right. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. And it sounds like your sort of teaching style is really aligned with TAB, Teaching for Artistic Behavior. I don't know if you know that Oh my God. No, I do not. (laughs) Oh, you will love it because it sounds like it's what you're doing already. I mean, it's basically just methodology that thinks of the student is the artist, the classroom is the studio, and then there's like this sort of question, what do artists do? So exactly what you talked about before with, you know, we're not making 30 similar projects that are designed really by the teacher, where, you know, each student is making whatever it is that they want to make and using the materials they think fit that project, the materials Mm -hmm. they like to work with, all that kind of stuff, and sharing their own ideas. I'm so, going to walk in Tuesday morning and go, and go to my principal and go, have you heard of TAB? <laughs> I Let love me it. Tell you. No, I mean, yeah. this is great. This is, uh, I'm reading, I'm reading now. Sorry, I kind of like to research while I'm talking. So I'm yeah, no, that's now. fine. No, that's great. I think really one important part that I'd make, I definitely want to talk about before I forget is the part about coming back to school that I'm really excited for and that we totally missed out on being virtual is mm-hmm. I love using the building that we're in mm-hmm. as my art material. So like what I mean by that is, so I'm on this like Brian Wilson, Beach Boys, uh, their album Pet Sounds. I'm on this kick right now where I'm just listening to Pet Sounds over and over and over and listening to all Brian Wilson's audio books and watching videos and stuff. I don't know why. Don't ask why. But <laughs> I, I'm just, I'm amazed by it. And he said this one thing. He goes, listen, because he was using like 20 instruments and the other Beach Boys are like, what are we doing, man? What are all these instruments? And Brian Wilson is like, the instruments aren't important. The studio is the instrument. The studio is mm. the instrument. And so I'm like, you know what? You know, in a way, the school is the material. So mm-hmm. what I like to do, and it's kind of twofold. First of all, it gets kids out of the classroom and gets them really thinking about like installation art and changing environments and things. So this mm-hmm. is really good for the kids that want to be architects or interior designers or something like that. But yeah. we think about the building and how that can be the stage for what we're making. Mm-hmm. So I'm in this brand new building. It's The building's like three and a half, four years old. And it's beautiful. And it has this huge spiral staircase. And then along the spiral staircase is this metal grid. It's like a screen door if all of the little wires were much bigger. That's the Mm -hmm. only way I can kind of explain it. So what we did is one day someone had donated a huge box of yarn and I had some paper clips and I said, all right, listen, we're going to go to this small little hidden corner of the school and I'm going to give you some yarn and, and then this things of paper clips. See if you guys can come up with a tool. If you can make some type of tool where you can like use the yarn as your pencil and draw pictures in this grid and, and, and use the little paper clip as a tool. Oh, and, and I forgot to mention too, it's sectioned off into two foot by two foot square. So it's like Mm -hmm. perfect for each kid to have their own square. So we went over there and and I didn't give them any direction. I said, yeah, just draw like doodle, like doodle on these things, draw whatever you want. And so they, I mean, everyone had their own little system. They used paper clips and they tied string around it and they sat there and we, we spent the week and people walking by were just like, whoa, they wanted to stop and watch. Mm -hmm. And so I knew there was something there. And then the draw, they, they were pretty cool. I was like, this is, I was like, there's something here. This is pretty cool. So then what we did did was they had to uh, investigate local legends or local stories from, I think I gave them 50 mile radius. They had a 50 mile radius and they had to investigate some story and then visualize it as a potential talking point with their audience. And so they planned out these drawings and they went out and then for like three weeks, every single class, we would go out there and they would be sitting out in the hallway drawing on these things and it was the coolest project i've ever done and and not only that is like so many visitors have to come right through there to right when they come into school Mm -hmm. they see that and and it was just awesome i mean it was like (laughs) i was like gosh i have good ideas they're doing all the hard (laughs) they're doing all the hard work they're actually making it i'm just kind of walking around and talking with them and stuff but uh it was it was really cool and it's a a perfect example of like okay well how can you take the structure of your building and make Mm. some type of instant installation or, or if not an installation, a really cool exhibition. How can you have mm-hmm. a student exhibition outside of your studio? 
the studio is the workshop where we're making the cabinets. Now, where are we going to go install the cabinets? That type of thing. Yeah, uh, I love that. And also just the the process that you facilitated with them, that it didn't, it didn't start with, okay, here's the design, let's make this. It started with, hey, here's some materials and a space. What can you do? Experiment, explore, try this out. And then after that, let's do some research and think about how we can really make this use that same process and materials that you just messed around with and played with and kind of figured out, use that, but put some research into it first. Such a great way to get into what an artist does. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Because it makes you feel like a mad scientist. It's like I'm running these experiments Mm -hmm. on children. And and to be (laughs) honest, I mean, I'll be, I'll be a hundred percent honest. A lot of times when I have like questions in my work on how I want to do stuff, I give it to them and I say, Hey, here's some materials. Like, what do you guys do something with this? And then I'll just sit back and watch and I'll be like, Whoa, that's working. Or, you know, Um, I don't want to, that's getting too muddy, but I'll let them mm -hmm. be my like (laughs) guinea pigs almost. And then, you know, when I get into my own practice, I'm like, you know, I saw so-and-so doing this, this is going to be great. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that, is that evil? I don't think that's evil. (laughs) I think it's cool. I think it's pretty cool. Yeah, but, I feel like it could be exciting for them. I don't know if you tell them about that, but that could be kind of cool for them to know about too. Oh yeah, I totally do. I Because I, yeah. I work on my own art at school. Mm-hmm. I have a big wall and I put uh, huge paper and canvases up and I'm always working on something. This past week, I was screen printing a bunch of bags just to play around and kind of get familiar with the screen printing supplies that we had. Mm-hmm. But I was doing my own design and the design that I was making were these weird birds that I've been using the school Xerox machine for. <laughs> I've been rolling ink, uh, rolling paint on paper and then going to the Xerox machine and just printing out a bunch of them and then cutting up the Xerox. And so mm-hmm. they've seen this progression. So for a week or two, they see me making these weird birds. And then when they came to school this week, I had taken one of those bird designs and I was screen printing it on a bag. So I think for me, you know, this is my gift. This is my strong point. I have to exploit it. So Mm -hmm. for them to see me constantly working is really important. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. I love being able to bring your own work as an artist into the classroom. And I would love to hear more about your own work. We've talked a lot about teaching. (laughs) Yeah, I'm glad that we're doing this because I forget how exciting teaching is to me sometimes because it's been (laughs) such a part of my life. I don't think I think about like I go to work and then when I come home, it's all about me and my work, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's nice to be talking about it right now because it's like, yeah. You got it. You got it. You got it pretty good. But yeah, so my own work, I think I had mentioned earlier that I was kind of like making things, but pretty much directionless. And then so what I started doing in my old school, we had like a $400 budget for the whole year for art supplies. So I was doing crazy scavenging for materials and things like that, which is really good boot camp for a new teacher, I think is to give them no budget, but they have to teach (laughs) a powerful curriculum, but with no budget. It's like (laughs) a really... It's like, dude, if you can do this, you know, you're setting yourself up with a killer foundation for the future. Mm -hmm. And so what I was doing was I hadn't learned yet that when it gets to painting, there's certain classes where you have to be the monitor when dishing out the paint or else you're going to have a huge mess on your hands. So at the time I was just like, yeah, there's the paint, get it, get what you need. And it was just a disaster. They were throwing Mm -hmm. away tons of paint that I didn't have. And so what I started doing was when I was trying to find a solution to that, I started just painting a bunch of paper and I was like, you know, we'll use this for collage. Well, I'll do a collage unit with them. And, you know, I'd been hanging wallpaper years before, but I hadn't really done that much collaging, just mm-hmm. making cards for people and stuff up to that point for fun. But <clears throat> so I started painting all this paper and then while I'm painting it, I was like, hmm, this is kind of interesting. So I started like, cutting them up and doing collages. And I think after like that first week, I was like, you know what? This is the first time I feel like I've made something that doesn't look like anyone else's work. And mm. I'm really satisfied with what it is. So I kept all the paper myself. We ne- I never let them use it. I ended up just keeping it all. And then it just kind of blew up from there, really. I mean, that's kind of – if you look at my work on Instagram or something – That's pretty much when I started taking art seriously. So it hasn't Mm. been that long. I mean, I'm 40 and and I really didn't start taking 
my art seriously until I was, you know, until like five or six years ago, but really mm -hmm. putting it in gear in the last two or three years. But so that's kind of how I get, found my like collage direction. Mm -hmm. And it's so funny too, because people always on Instagram, like send me other collage artists work and stuff. And I yeah. hate to it, say it, but it's like, dude, I, I don't really like collage. Like I don't, <laughs> I don't like, I mean, collage, like other art, like I like paintings. I like contemporary painting a lot. I love mm -hmm. abstract painting and sculpture and just collage doesn't, you know, other people's collages don't really do it for me. But for me, I think that's kind of unique. I don't know if there's a lot of artists like, I don't know. Uh, it's weird. I don't understand it. Like I'll walk by collages all day long in a museum or something, but then get to the paintings and just go crazy. But so I'm not really knowing where I wanted to go. Slowly started taking pictures of weird trash and bicycles that had been locked up and kind of stripped of all of their parts and things. And, and then slowly but surely over the last couple of years, my the collages, they get a little bit more, uh, they've been doing two things. In one way, they're getting way more intricate and way more um, controlled. But then mm -hmm. I have this other hand in me that is the complete opposite, it's super loose. It's kind of like a balance of the two. I do one. Mm -hmm. If I'm working on a big collage that has a lot of detail, I'll probably make 10 or 15 smaller pieces during the course of that one just to give my mm -hmm. brain and my hands a break. Because a lot of pressure rides on when you're doing stuff that's kind of realistic, like me anyway, I I'm worried I'm going to mess it up or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I need these little breaks where I'm allowed to mess them up and, and allowed to just be more like, what would happen if I just made and didn't overthink it? <laughs> what comes out, you know? So, and then to, that brings, I've, I've done a couple of residencies, um, but when the pandemic shut schools down, so this was the story I was talking about earlier. It's really cool. So last March, I got an email from a friend who had bought a painting a few years ago. Well, she works for Apple and then she works, Apple owns this musician's platform called Platoon. And they had an artist that was looking for a specific style and she showed them the piece that she had bought for me a few years ago and they were like yes let's do it so th she mm. was like hey would you want to would you be interested in doing some album artwork for one of our artists and i was like oh my god i was like heck yeah i was like that, that sounds yeah. great so come to find out they wanted four album covers they were going to animate i mean it was like it was so cool and they they really pushed me creatively so had i not had to go virtual i I would have had a hard, I would have done it, but I would have had a much harder time completing the project because I was like, you know, from morning till night, I was just a machine. And it was really cool because it pushed me because they would say, okay, look, here's the song. We have these ideas, see what you can make. So that's not how I ever worked before. So all of a sudden I'm working with these parameters that I'm not used to. And so mm -hmm. I started making a ton of this work that just was not what I was used to. And it's scary and it's kind of painful at first, but it's so good for you. I mean, I just, I look back on that. And I'm like, I can't believe I made 120, 25 by 25 inch collages over a period of like six months. I mean, wow. I made a ton of work. Um, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, it really pushed the evolution of m me as an artist. Like it put me in hyperspeed. And so mm -hmm. now I'm trying to come to grips with like, okay, how do I, how do I stop this? <laughs> because now <laughs> my, my brain is programmed that way. And I just, I'm always grinding, which is really good. But at the same time, you know, I need to, I don't know what I'm trying to say, but they ended up using my, my art for their album art. And, and it was super cool. They, they sent a film crew over to my studio from LA and New York. And we spent two days shooting a mini documentary on how I was making the pieces they animated them all with this really cool augmented reality um, app where you can listen to all of the artist's songs. And then the collage work that I made for each song comes alive and you can walk yeah. around it and you can get really close to it. They did all this really super cool stuff. I'm super grateful for that project. And then I've had two solo exhibitions. One of them was during the pandemic, so it was super weird. You had to drive a robot around the gallery to, uh. <laughs> to, view, to view the work. Amazing. Um, yeah, it was kind of a bomber because I had the most, uh, just the best body of work I've ever made was in there. Mm. So it was kind of heartbreaking in a way because it was like, man, mm. uh, this would have been so cool. Because I think the more and more, 
I think artists can relate to this, right? We try to figure out why are we doing what we're doing? Because it can seem like a really self-serving thing, just making art, like really self-centered, because you're just thinking about your work and, and you know, how am I going to progress to the next level? So I think about this stuff a lot. And I think ultimately, there's something about me walking into an exhibition that really fires me up. So mm -hmm. at the end of the day, when I feel like my work is meaningless or something like that, I have to remember that my point is to make something to inspire others. I do it in my job, mm. but I also, in my professional life, I want to make something that gets somebody's gears going. And mm -hmm. so I think ultimately I, I do want to sell work. You know, I, I want to sell work to kind of, to keep the machine running, but really I, I want to exhibit more. Yeah. I want to have more shows. I want more bodies in front of my work, thinking about it and talking about it and pushing others to, to do the same and to make more uh, work as well. So that's kind of where I'm at now. I've got a studio here in Norfolk, but I've also got one at my house. So yeah. I work here and out of my house. My larger studio is in the back of a big old industrial building. And there's a guy who owns a salsa company. He's rented out the back of it to us, uh -huh. to me and another artist. And it's bare bones, but it's nice and big and 24 hour access. And it's super creepy and cool. And, <laughs> And I do a lot of my big painting there and a lot mm -hmm. of my stretching canvas, priming paper. But also if, if I have a collector or somebody who wants to buy a piece, that's where we'll go and meet. But then I also have a home studio where I can, you know, hang out with my wife, hang out with my cat, but also work and shower mm -hmm. and eat and not have to waste time driving or anything like that. And, and I can get super right. focused here at the house. Um, and, you yeah. know. Yeah. Do you then, does that mean you have all your supplies kind of doubled or do you take things back and forth? That was always the struggle I had when I had a studio out of the house that I was like, uh -huh. I would get over there and then I'd be like, oh man, I forgot something at home or vice versa. I'd be home and be like, oh, it's at the studio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For a while I was doing the tool bag thing. To be honest, my goal is to be more nomadic. And so mm -hmm. I want to be able to, I, I understand that if we, you have to have the studio because it kind of helps sell paintings. <laughs> mm -hmm. Having the studio, it's, it's, it's a weird thing, but it kind of helps sell artwork. That being said, I'm on this thing where I'm trying to strip down only to my basic necessities. I have scissors mm -hmm. and knives that I love. I have the glue that works for me. I have the paper that works for me. I have the, the paints. When I can afford Goldens, I buy Goldens. I, I have the things that I'm really, that I know I need. So I'm slowly trying to strip down everything else. And so in that respect, yes, it is, it's kind of easy to have a set here and a set in my other studio. Mm -hmm. But that being said, I go there to paint. If you're not from familiar with my work, I, what I do is I paint large sheets of paper and then I just put them in a stack and I have mm -hmm. a huge library of painted papers and I'll just paint whatever color I'm feeling that day. And yeah. then when I go to make my collages, I'm like, oh, I need to see blue. So I'll thumb through and try to find the, the perfect color that I'm looking for. So, yeah. um, you know, I just, I, I always make sure that I go spend a couple of days a week painting paper just for the fun of it, whatever comes mm -hmm. out. Sometimes I'll make some specifically for a project, but for the most part, I've found it's more authentic if I just paint whatever and then use that. And so I keep most of my paper here, but I have some there. But and then I use like a Jade 403 archival book binding glue and mm. I, I paint below and on top of my collage paper. This is the irony of it all. I use the exact same tools that I did hating hanging wallpaper for so many years. Now I use those same tools and really some of the same skills and methods for creating my artwork. Mm, I love it. The <laughs> like weird. techniques and skills that you pick up along the way. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, the paper's buckling. Oh, there's an air bubble. Oh, wait, wait, let's smash this seam together. You know, I use a, a wallpaper smoother. I use the Ulfa knife mm. I used when I hung wallpaper. The glue is a bit different and the application of the glue is different, but it, it's all very, very similar and mm -hmm. so the, my friend who I worked with hanging wallpaper he loves to he's like man you used to hate using this stuff and he's like <laughs> he just always brings it up he's like it's it's just so funny how much of your life you spend with these tools and it's and when at one point you would do anything to get away from them yeah uh that is really funny. When you're working on canvas, is it all paper attached to the canvas or is there like the sort of base layer of paint um, um, on the canvas? 
So a couple of my own personal rules when uh, just is I, I always like to build my own stretcher frame. And mm-hmm. if I don't build them, I have a woodworking friend who I throw some money to and he makes it. And mm-hmm. then, but I, I usually stretch my own canvas and then I'll gesso it. And then mm-hmm. I just go straight to it from the gesso straight mm-hmm. with the paper. So nothing yeah. down below. Now with a canvas, a lot of times I'll <clears throat> do something that I don't do when I'm working on paper. I'll actually like throw some glue on the canvas because it seems to just want to drink up the glue so mm-hmm. i'll throw some glue on the canvas before the glued piece of paper goes to it but what's kind yeah. of a pain like the there's pros and cons to working on canvas one of the pros is people who buy paintings love a nice big thick canvas people just love mm-hmm. that and they love being able to buy the artwork and hang it without having to go buy a frame yeah. um the other good thing is when the <clears throat> paper dries it's like tight as a drum it is so it's like mm-hmm. way tighter than it'll ever be on with just painting onto it it's like mm-hmm. it's so cool how tight it gets but some of the negatives are a lot of times when the paper starts free freaking out or there's a trapped air bubble and you can't lift the paper because it's already attached and you'll just shred it. You start to like press with the smoother a bunch and it dents up, it starts denting up the, and if you're not careful and you apply too much pressure, you you know, you'll never get rid of that dent. But yeah, so it gives a little, like when you're, when I'm working on paper, the problem is the sheets start to get, I kind of do like what you do with watercolor. I tape the, I work standing up mm-hmm. by the way. I don't, I don't work flat. Everything mm-hmm. I do is up on against a wall. So yeah. when I put my paper on the wall to collage on paper, I run uh, frog tape on all four sides. So it's all down. Mm-hmm. And as I'm working, it really buckles and wants to come off. But you know, mm-hmm. when I go to bed at night and wake up the next morning, I'll come in, it'll be super flat flatter than it was before I bought the paper. I mean, it just like goes super flat. So, you know, paper has its challenges. The The easiest material to work on is a wood panel with collage because mm. you can press it all day long and nothing happens. It's a nice solid yeah. surface. On. Yeah, I love working on panels too. <laughs> and yeah, I just, are. I feel like it's so interesting to hear about any artist process, but just hearing your process with collage and the connection to hanging wallpaper, really interesting. <laughs> Yeah, I did. I like tried to explore. At one point, I was like, you know what? Let's embrace this whole wallpaper thing. So there was Mm -hmm. a few months where I was like painting huge rolls of paper and just going Mm -hmm. and buying house paints that were like mist tents and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And just using uh, big squeegees on sticks and painting paper and then actually wallpapering a wall with it. I was like, whoa, this is cool. But it's really expensive and Mm -hmm. maybe it's cool to have I have that trick in my bag at at any Mm -hmm. point if uh, I ever you know get a gallery to let me do my thing maybe I'll wallpaper an entire room with my collage stuff but yeah yeah yeah, so there was one point where I was like I'm gonna really drive that you know I'm gonna take that into overdrive I'm gonna hang my own Mm -hmm. wallpaper and stuff that's pretty cool yeah that's awesome I feel like it's also really interesting to hear how you don't gravitate towards other collage artists. Because I feel like as looking in, I immediately think of other collage artists that you might be interested in. And I feel like I do that with a lot of with any artist I'm looking at. I'm like, oh, you should look at this person and this person. But I I do the same thing. Yeah, like I'm similar to you. Like I'm not as interested (laughs) in people that are doing work similar to mine. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, maybe part of it is like, is like, no, 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 no. I don't want to see, I don't want to see anything that's better than mine because I might start (laughs) copying it or something, you know, part of it is probably that, but Mm -hmm. also it's just a natural thing. I think the first show, like the sensation show, I think it was at the Brooklyn museum in like 1999 or 2000. It was the first art museum art exhibition that I uh, went to where I was like, Oh my God, art can be absolutely anything. Cause there was just Mm. the weirdest stuff there. And it really was, I was like, Oh, Oh, here's what we can do. And Mm. so that's kind of like, I I think I've been chasing when I go, when I like to look at art and talk about art with people and stuff, I think I chase that feeling (laughs) a lot of times. I want to see art that really pushes the boundary and Mm. that use kind of non-traditional materials. So, Mm -hmm. and I mean, there, yeah, you know, there's some collage artists too that are just so good. I'm like, no, no, I don't want to see it. I don't want to see it. (laughs) No, la, 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 not looking at it. And then, oh, here's the other reason why too. So 
no matter what you're doing, right? If you just draw or paint or whatever, you progress in skill, right? If you do anything mm-hmm. long enough, you're going to get good at it. So I have this like judgment thing inside me too. And, and I don't verbalize it. I just think it to myself. When I see some collage stuff, I'm like, oh yeah, I remember facing those challenges three years ago. Like, I, mm-hmm. you know, I've grown past those challenges. So it's really hard not to like gauge where they're at, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. as far as like their progression, which isn't a bad thing. It just shows that I'm super aware of what I'm doing. Like and I care, mm-hmm. I guess. So a lot of times when I see other collage artists, I see the exact same challenges that I faced at certain points. It was like, mm-hmm. oh yeah, I remember trying to cut perfect circles with a knife and them getting you know that those edges and things or, or whatever that was probably a bad example but there's something there where I can kind of identify where they're at in their game and mm-hmm. again if it's if it's better than mine you know I <laughs> I gotta you know <laughs> not look so. uh, yeah yeah I totally get that like the technique that yeah you're always kind of striving and you definitely can see when someone else is is also striving like they're on that journey either ahead of you or behind you. (laughs) Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's all good. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The one that really came up for me because I feel like you use collage in a very painterly way. And I know you said you don't like this, but I'm going to throw out Alice. Alice Stone Collins also uses collage in a really interesting painterly way. Alice Stone who? Collins. Collins. So it's really like really similar, I feel like, to just the way that you both are working. I don't I think your work, like the two of you have very separate sort of styles, but oh, this well, sort of is and yeah. she's collage. It's collage, yeah. So it's the same thing. Like I look at your work and I'm like, wait, that's collage, really? <laughs> yeah, you know, that's this is amazing. Like I love her work. So you've you've you're doing great already. You're already Yay. pulling me out of my like, <laughs> like I love this. This is great. And I really I think it's awesome. Whoa. And yeah. I really relate to this piece that's like on the front page of her um website. It's it shows like toys in the grass. And I totally remember uh, playing with action figures when I was a kid and losing them all in the grass. I love that. Yes. But, yeah, that is super cool. Oh, that's the thing too, right? Is there's this disconnect in my work to the outside world because mm-hmm. I mean, the majority of people who see my art, which isn't that many, but they see it all on Instagram. And mm-hmm. so I'll have these moments where I actually have my physical works and I'll take them to show somebody and they'll be like, oh my God, I didn't know that you worked this big. And I was yeah. like, yeah, you know, it's a 60 inch wide collage. It's a big collage. Oh, or they'll say, oh my God, I was like, I, I didn't know that it was collaged. And I was like, yeah, right. so it's hard. <laughs> like the, the social media thing is really cool for connecting, but it's mm-hmm. really bad at showing what the real deal is, like what's in front mm-hmm. uh, of you. And, and unfortunately for me, my work looks way better when you're in front of it as opposed to looking mm-hmm. at it on a um, on a, a feed, a news feed or something. But that being said, too, I, sometimes people think that my stuff's digital or something like that. Mm-hmm. They're like, oh, you, you know, you work in Photoshop or Illustrator. And it's like, no, it's yeah. hand cut. <laughs> yep. Scissors, glue. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh. And what have you been able to do to get past that? Is it just really good photography or photos that kind of show the scale, even maybe videos? Yeah, what have been things that work for you to help bridge that gap? (laughs) Yeah, you're right. Like it hasn't, I haven't bridged it yet because I mean, I think like once I get, my goals are to eventually connect with the gallery, have bigger shows. And I mean, those are my goals. Mm -hmm. And so I think once those happen, it's, you know, it's until that happens, I really haven't got the point across because it's mm-hmm. still a challenge. Now, those the things that you just listed are exactly it though. That's what I am mm-hmm. doing. I'm trying to show, trying to include more time-based media on my feed of, you know, walking up to the collage, showing the glue and the paper, showing making, mm-hmm. doing the kind of behind the scenes type stuff. But that's really all I can do. I mean, this just happened a few weeks ago. I had a book of collages with me and I sat down with someone and they were like, whoa, and I was like, dude, we've known each other for how long? <laughs> like, you did, you know, it's like, it's, it just, on one hand, it's really cool to see that reaction. I'm like, okay, cool. I am doing something that, that is actually as worthy as it feels. But, you know, and it's also exciting too, because I feel like, I don't know, I'm just ready for the next step. And I think it's around the corner. Yeah. Yeah. And then I always love to get into a bit of the sort of nitty gritty business side of things. And you've talked Mm -hmm. about having solo shows, connecting with 
don't remember the name of it, the musicians and the company that brought you in on that yeah. project. Mm-hmm. And then ambitions. So I guess the question really is, how are you finding the opportunities that you're getting? And then maybe if you can share anything about any advice for other artists, but also maybe speaking to, you know, what you're doing to kind of get to those bigger goals. Yeah, excellent. Well, so I there's this artist, Taylor Anton White. He's in Richmond, mm-hmm. which is like an hour and a half from here. And him, he's been actually really cool to let me come hang with him at the studio and talk. He's been like mentoring me a little bit, you know? Mm-hmm. It's been cool. Like we built a cool relationship that's like purely around art and making. So I go to Richmond a lot. So when I'm in town, I say, hey, are you there? And I'll stop in and we talk. And every time I leave, our talks have me just fired up. I wish I could just mm-hmm. run to my studio and make. And so I know that there's something special there. And, and so he's kind of giving me tips and stuff. He, he's got some really, if you haven't followed him, he's awesome. His, his work is just so much fun. And when you see him in person too, they're just, they're amazing. And, and he doesn't mm-hmm. hold the traditional mold of like what an artist is, and which is what I really love. But so right now, what I'm doing is I, I have a fair bit of commission work, good commission work, not the kind that's like, hey, can you paint my dog hanging out of a car smoking a cigar on the, my kid's wall? Like not that <laughs> kind of commission, but the commissions where it's like, hey, here's a chunk of money. Can you give me seven pieces? Can you mm-hmm. make seven pieces for me? Like that's good commission work in my opinion. Mm-hmm. And so I've got a fair a bit lot of, of that. freedom. Yeah. Ex- yeah. And, and it's someone who's investing in you in your mm-hmm. journey, right? So yeah. I'm able to keep doing what I'm doing. So I have a fair bit of that work, but I'll be completely honest with you. I receive at least a rejection letter a week. I mean, I spend way too much money applying for things and I'm probably applying for the wrong stuff, but Mm. I'm applying for a lot of stuff and I'm constantly getting rejected. And, you know, I get, I get kind of sad for a few minutes when I've Mm -hmm. just read so many of these letters. Uh, Mm. But then it's like, you know what, that being said, I actually was asked to juror a local show here recently where there was like 600 pieces that Mm. that applied for the show. And so I was like, Oh, man, so I had to sit down. And I saw exactly what the person sees who's sending me my rejection letter. I saw mm-hmm. exactly what they're seeing. And it kind of clicked for me. It's like, oh, mm-hmm. they someone could be someone could have just walked out of a museum with a show that highly influenced them. And that's going to change the direction of what they're going to select. Or, you know, mm-hmm. you just never know why they're selecting what they're selecting. And so it's not personal. You know, right? If someone has a big task in front of them and they have to make like split second decisions. I mean, they can sit there and think about mm-hmm. it but for you know they have to make these decisions and they have a deadline and stuff so that's cool and also i applied to some residents he was like oh, i can't wait to get this and then after applying looked at that was like oh there's 900 people applying for these 14 mm-hmm. spots <laughs> it's like well no wonder yeah. i didn't get it those odds are horrible so right. I, I think i can become i think i can work on my efficiency as far as applying for things mm-hmm. i am actually participating in the new york crit club starting oh, next cool. week i think yeah so i'm pretty mm-hmm. stoked on that because because I isolate a lot, right? I, I go to work, mm-hmm. I come home, I work in my art, I hang with my wife. I'm not around a lot of other artists who are taking it seriously, right? So mm-hmm. I felt like I really needed some peer feedback, which, mm-hmm. you know, I have some people who are, you know, who are in the art world and doing things that I don't want to bug them anymore. So I was like, I better, <laughs> I don't want to bug the, I keep bugging the people who are, who are close to, you know, my connections. So I need to branch out. So I thought, you know, this would be pretty cool. So I'm going to do the New York Crit Club and I'm really excited about that. It, I've done all my research on the, the instructors and stuff and it looks super cool. I'm hoping that helps me as far as getting more feedback on the direction my work's in and, and where it can head and stuff. Mm-hmm. And maybe some things to try out. Yeah. I just recently did a collaboration with, they're called the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. And it's actually a big thing around here because we're so close to the Chesapeake Bay. And mm-hmm. so I teamed up with them and did a collaboration and made three large pieces of art that were centered around um, my experience of hanging and learning from them. And those mm-hmm. works have been in the uh, Museum of Contemporary Art here 
for the last four months. That's opened awesome. up a cool door too. Yeah, because there's this educational connection, right? So anytime yeah. I can make those types of connections, mm-hmm. I do a lot of community-based outreach stuff. Next weekend, there's a community garden that's run by teens right down the street from my house. So I'm mm-hmm. working with them and, and we I drew this mural up and they're, I'm going to help them paint it. And so that's next weekend. So I try to do a bunch of stuff like that too that's outside of my classroom. Because I think it's a good idea to like set your goals, to write down your Mm -hmm. goals. Like, what do you want? And, and one of the things I want is to, I want to open up the possibility for incredible opportunities. And with the power of having those opportunities, I want to give back. I have to make that a a part of it is giving back somehow, not just Mm -hmm. being like, oh, I just want to sell my work in a gallery. I want to do more than that. I want to, I want to help other artists and help Mm -hmm. young people kind of flourish as well. You know, I want to use my power for good. (laughs) Yes. Yeah, that's huge. And I love there's so much good stuff in there. Lots of great advice and just encouragement, even, you know, thinking about rejections. And I recently talked to an artist who shared this idea of making a goal to get a certain number of rejections and Uh using that as a way to kind of shift your mindset. Oh, that is really cool thinking. Mm hmm. That you're, you know, every time you're getting a rejection, that's telling you like, okay, well, I did something, I applied to something, and I put myself out there and one step further, which I feel like is really helpful when I'm often sort of depressed every time I get that email. Yeah. (laughs) And take a little moment for a pity party. But Mm -hmm. I feel like shifting your mindset around that could be super, super helpful. Yeah, that's a great way to look at it. This thing, I I had this theory too on greatness as well. It's like Mm -hmm. we we have these people that we call masters or, you know, oh, they were a genius, right? And Mm -hmm. I I, I think that there's a lot more of them out there. And, Mm -hmm. but I think what it, it's like, the perfect storm needs to happen. The person needs to be busting their ass, working hard. And then when the opportunity arrives, they need to, the timing needs to be right where they can jump on it and, and go for it. And then yeah. they need to be given the opportunity to make, to channel that injury, that energy to make something great. And so mm-hmm. I always tell my students this, and I tell myself this all the time, when the opportunity arrives, you need to have been grinding up until that point. So when it does arise, you, you just kick ass, you just go for it and you're ready. So I'm always kind of in like preparation, you know, mm-hmm. I, I look at it that way, even I'm, I mean, I'm the type of artist that like, if I'm sad or in a bad head place or something like that, it's really hard for me to want to make artwork. If I have a cold or my energy is low, if I'm tired, I have a really hard time making artwork. But what mm-hmm. I try to do is say, no, 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 you're doing it. So I, I get in there and, and just try to make something. And even if what I make is awful, I just need to be in my studio working no matter what. So yeah. it's my theory that when the opportunity arrives, you just have to jump forward. But you have to be ready. You can't be like having had spent the last month sitting on the couch watching Netflix. Like <laughs> it's not going to happen. You know what I'm saying? Right. But I don't know. It's like discipline, yeah. I guess, right? I think discipline is really important. Yeah. And I feel like we're... We're circling back to what you said at the beginning, talking about when life opens a door, you jump through it. And then also connecting to you have these sort of impulses, like you want to make things, but adding the professionalism to that, adding the discipline to that, just to up your game as an artist. Yeah, I mean, it's... I also want to like give my kids challenges and stuff. It's like, Mm -hmm. all right, listen, you have to do 20 drawings of a pair of scissors, like some kind of crazy Mm -hmm. number of the same thing over and over, because I believe that that repetition is going to get you somewhere that you would have never in a million years got to had you not done that process. And so I, I feel like that's the same thing with my art making. It's like, if I'm kind of in a dry area where I don't really have the ideas that I kind of keep, there's lists all over my studio with just, I mean... Right now, if I were, it'd be kind of comical to look to read some of the lists. Like I think it says, "What about Bob the movie?" And then there's something about Abraham Lincoln. I have these weird lists that wherever you know the uh, an idea for something pops in my head, I kind of write it and paste it up. And I, I think of it as like when the time comes and you don't know what to make, you're gonna make a scene from "What about Bob?" <laughs> you're gonna you know do a collage of the painting that was hanging in Abraham Lincoln's uh, room when when he passed away, or, or something like that. You know, right? So that's just kind of 
of one little trick that I have to keep me productive, but yeah. Yeah, no, I love that. And yeah, keeping, I, I use so many lists as well. I feel like that's really helpful. I like to, this Alice Stone Collins work, by the way. This is cool. I'm looking yeah, at it right she has now. So much great work. And she does, I feel like she does a really nice job of documenting her process and sharing that even, you know, from like sort of time-lapse videos, but also photos of all the scraps of paper all over the place. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah. what's cool is like her fascination with objects because I share that. Mm -hmm. I share this. I keep finding, I don't know why, but I keep finding sandwiches and Ziploc bags everywhere, like outside. <laughs> so yeah. I've been photographing every sandwich I come across. I mean, there's a high school behind my house, so maybe that's why. <laughs> but I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, this is kind of cool. It, but it, when I think about actually making collages of them, oh, tr glass transparency is a nightmare. Like trying to do glass or transparent surfaces, it's so hard. I always have trouble but it's like these little sandwiches in these little windows yeah. oh this is cool yeah i would love to throw you some just get to know you wrapping up questions oh yes um, so one really broad one what are you curious about right now if i have to be honest i'm really curious about the future <laughs> i mean it's mm -hmm. what i think about all the time it's not a really sexy or exciting answer but it's it's what i you know i think it's probably not even a good answer at all because that's probably what everyone <laughs> would say but let's let's talk about let's let me answer that as in like my artwork right mm -hmm. now I'm really curious about the way that people just take pictures really quickly. Like our whole, my whole world, you know, if, if I go into the online realm, I'm looking at what other people are seeing and other people find mm -hmm. interesting. So I've been screenshot, I've been going to my local Craigslist and Facebook marketplace and screenshotting these awful pictures people are taking of stuff they're selling. <laughs> and I don't know why, but there's something there about the way that other, that, that everyone sees the world and how they decide to capture it. That's really interesting, but it's only the ones that are really bad. <laughs> I only like the ones that are bad because I feel like those are the most authentic. They just held their camera up and didn't even try and just hit the button. So I've been filling, I've been like eating up my iCloud storage with picture upon picture upon picture of Craigslist and like weird boat motors and people selling canoes and kayaks. And, um, and, it, and it's not because I'm trying to buy a boat motor. It's because I'm like, there's some interesting idea there that I want to explore more with my art. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And I, this idea too, you're getting at this process of curation that we do. Like I kind of do the same thing. I have so many photos that I use as reference photos and little oh, yeah. mini collections of here's this theme of like 10,000 photos. <laughs> and here's this theme of all these photos that eventually I'll kind of dig through and pick out the ones I'm going to make a piece of around yeah yeah I love sometimes that process. Yeah, they stick out right you, there's a few mm -hmm. of them that you just keep coming back to and you're like man there is nothing really special about this like on the surface but for some reason my soul keeps wanting to look at this one yeah i'm right. the same i'm the same way and, and i have pictures like that in my phone that i have that, that are five years old that i haven't even used yet but i've held on to them because there's something there yeah, yeah, I was just, that makes me think. It's also, this is weird. Maybe another artist can relate, or maybe you can relate too. It's like when you're grinding, when you're just nonstop thinking about your own work and making, and then you step outside to go eat lunch, I'll be staring at a tree and my brain will be breaking down. It's almost like what the Terminator or Robocop, like all this computer mm. stuff comes in my vision. It's like, if you wanted to collage that tree, you would do dark uh -huh. pieces here and light pieces in the middle. And then you would have a, a washed out fuzzy background to kind of lay the background for like, and then I yeah. have to shake my head and I'm like, I'm thinking about collaging this tree. I'm staring at right now. It's weird. <laughs> oh, I love that though. I love hearing that. I definitely do similar things. <laughs> Yeah, because you're interested in water. So I imagine every time you see water, mm -hmm. you kind of like are taking these like little brain pictures. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I have my like phone and Google photos are just full of water. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so has anyone told you that you're brave? That's like, you're like a brave artist. Like you want to yeah. approach water. Water is so freaky. It's wild. Well, I love how it like fragments 
whatever's in it and all the distortion there. There's so much room for really beautiful abstraction, which I love. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Cool. Another just kind of silly question. I feel like it's silly, but maybe it's not. You know, we talked about zines about family recipes. I always like to ask people, like, what's your favorite food? Oh, my favorite food, my favorite food to eat. Well, I grew up on the water here, Mm -hmm. so fishing and stuff. And so at a young age, I learned to fish. So I would say that seafood is my favorite food, but it's not like favorite, like I could always eat it. It's like I really Mm -hmm. enjoy when I do eat it. It's not something that I overdo. And then, so I grew up catching flounder with my dad. My dad was a flounder Mm. fisherman. So just growing up, I I liked it. It was great. It was good. And recently I had a friend take a trip to Alaska and they caught halibut, which is like Mm. a flounder times a hundred. They're like (laughs) huge and beautiful animals. Well, they brought back halibut and gave me some. And I was like, this is my favorite fish I've ever eaten. This has has the taste. This is what I'm looking for. So I think halibut right now is my favorite food. But if you like, I'm very regimented. It's weird. So with my lifestyle, I'm super regimented. Mm. I go to sleep kind of similar times. I I work out similar times. I I eat the same food all the time. I'm super boring. But then when (laughs) it comes to my artwork, my art is all over the place, which is weird. Mm -hmm. It's like the one area of my life where chaos is just constantly churning. Or Mm. and so I eat a lot of chicken and fish and just simple vegetables and salad. So that's what I eat. Yeah. a lot of yeah not necessarily my like favorite right I feel like there's some balance there like in order for there to be a bit of chaos in your art making you need the sort of regimented life in the other areas yeah maybe maybe the the regimented life gives me the stability and the foundation that allows me to have mm-hmm. an art studio in my house and down the street where I can just make a mess and not have any time constraints or anything like that right exactly That's a great Um, way to look at it. Thank you very much. Yes. (laughs) And is there anyone that you would like to thank or give sort of a shout out to? Oh, I mean, I'd have to give a shout out to my beautiful wife, Blair. She's so supportive. My home studio is next to our bedroom. So I make her, well, she decides to sleep on the couch on the nights where I'm like, listen, I'm going to be up for a while. (laughs) Like I have a (laughs) deadline. So, you know, that, but also like I'll shoot up to New York or something like that to see a show Mm -hmm. or, or, you know, do something like that. And she's so supportive of that stuff. So Mm -hmm. I'd have to, you know, that's, that's not, that's rare. I stay Mm -hmm. really busy and that has been something that's gotten me in trouble (laughs) in past (laughs) relationships, but Mm -hmm. that's what makes us work is she, she knows my passions and she knows how good they are for me. And so Mm -hmm. she completely supports them. And so, of course, I'd have to do that. I'd love to thank, you know, Taylor White, too, because he also, Mm -hmm. he helps me out. I mean, he sets a great example of helping out someone who is, and it's like what I would live by, right? Is like if someone's serious and they need some help, but they're genuinely going to use the suggestions and, Mm -hmm. you know, try to the best of their ability to keep pushing forward. Like I'll help him all day long. And he kind of has been doing mm-hmm. that with me. It's been awesome. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, and then also the the Virginia Mocha here, they have always mm-hmm. been supportive. And they, they've given me a, a, this group show recently this year, which was great. Mm-hmm. And help, you know, they gave artist stipends for supplies and stuff, which is super cool. Oh, it's always nice awesome. when, yeah, that's really nice mm-hmm. when that happens. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then last thing, where can listeners connect with you online? Um, great. Yeah. So my Instagram is oh. at duct tape ponytail. <laughs> my wife, when she was little, they dared her to either lick an old lamp or have a duct tape ponytail. And I always remember uh, that. And I was like, you know what? That's really cool. She could also uh, just look up Andy Harris and it should pop up. The little picture is like this weird little skeleton hand in the little you know circular image thing. I have a website, aharrisart.com. That's got a nice clear view of my work, my CV, my current artist statement. But I'll tell you what, that artist statement, I'll go in there at like 12 o'clock at night and just write some weird idea that I have down. So that artist statement part is like, artist statements are so hard because I don't want to tell people what to think when they see my work, but it's one of these things that are a necessity. So yeah, they can go there as well. And uh, if you want to listen to some punk rock and roll, you can check out my band Crime Line on Spotify. 
you might notice the collaged cover. It's black and white. It's pretty cool looking. So yeah, that's it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Andy. This was really great. I feel like there's so much good advice in there and just really interesting to hear more about your work and your process. No, well, thank you very much. And thank you for doing what you're doing too, because I think it's a great place to go listen and get a little bit Mm -hmm. of fire, get inspired to go do your own work. So I think you're doing some real good by putting such energy into this stuff. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it fires me up too. (laughs) Yes, awesome. Thank you so much for listening. As always, you can reach me at Teaching Artist Podcast on Instagram or Teaching Artist Podcast at gmail.com. Who do you want to hear from? Please share your recommendations of teaching artists. And if you loved this episode, please subscribe, leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts, and follow me. It really makes a big difference. Thank you. Thank you.